On the line with us is our old buddy David Sirota. He's also the uh, founder of the Daily Poster, a great daily newsletter you can get in your email box at no charge. Uh, you can tweet him at David Sirota. He's also the uh, narrator and executive producer of a new podcast available over at audible.com. It's titled Meltdown. And, uh, and he's also got a movie coming out. So uh, I just want to bounce a couple things off him. Uh, David, welcome back. It's great to have you on. Uh, tell us about, first of all, your, your piece in the Rolling Stone, Democrats' betrayals are jeopardizing American democracy. I, I believe this is kind of at the center of, of Meltdown, of, of your new podcast. It is, it is, and thanks for having me on. Uh, the, sure. the basic argument is... Da David, if I could interrupt you, if you could get your mouth closer to the microphone, it sounds like you're talking from an echo chamber here. Sure, is that better? That's much, that's much better. Thank okay, you. yeah. So, so, so listen, the, the connection between economic policy and uh, democracy, I think, is not all that well appreciated uh, in our larger media conversation. Bernie Sanders, as an example, has said that if we do not deliver real material help to people right now, uh, that it will only fuel a, a push uh, for uh, again, uh, the assault on democracy. Uh, it will only fuel authoritarians. And, and what I think he, what yeah, and what I think he means is is that essentially, if people keep voting for change. And politicians keep promising that they're going to deliver a uh, real change. If politicians keep promising specific policies, and then politicians get into office and side with their corporate donors and don't deliver that real change, then what the meta message being sent to voters is, your vote doesn't really matter that much, uh, that your vote I isn't that uh, important. And so then when you go to voters and you say, please vote for us, at least for us to protect democracy, uh, voters are saying, I just used the democratic process to vote for you. Uh, you promised me change, and you didn't deliver change. So as it relates to the current situation with the reconciliation bill, this is what's on the line. If they do not really deliver real material help to people, uh, a lot of people are going to be wondering, uh, what happened in the last election? Was the last election worth it? And the cautionary tale is in our new podcast series, which is what happened in 2009 and 2010. The Obama administration came in making all sorts of promises to get tough on Wall Street, to deliver real help to millions of, of, of homeowners. And what ended up happening was a very top-down bailout, which gave most of its money to a handful of financial institutions. Uh, there was not a lot of aid delivered to regular homeowners. Uh, and ultimately, that helped create the backlash conditions, first for the Tea Party and then for Donald Trump. Yeah, and 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 frankly, we don't want to see that repeated. Well, in fact, I was talking with a caller in the last hour about this. You know, on the one hand, you want to uh, blow up the filibuster and pass voting rights le legislation because Republicans are messing with our right to vote. Uh, you know, setting up the theft of the 2024 election, frankly. And on the other hand, uh, if they if they don't pass these two, both of these pieces of uh, legislation. Uh, then there's going to be a real crisis like you described. You know, if cynicism will reign once again. And there will be, even if we have voting rights, they'll be, you know, we'll be screwed going forward. It's a real tough one. It's a real tough one. And, and right now you've got Democrats, uh, progressive Democrats, who are being asked to trust the Josh Gottheimers of the world and just pass the, uh, the corporate, you know, the, the, the so-called bipartisan uh, piece of legislation, infrastructure legislation, and, and just wait on the other one. Don't worry, we'll get to it. I'm, I'm very skeptical about that. What are your thoughts as a you know, former speechwriter for Bernie and a good observer of the politics of this? What do you think? Oh, he dropped off. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Okay, David, I'm sorry. You're back on the air. Yeah, I am. I, look, I think the idea of taking a deal, uh, the idea of not having there actually even be a deal. I think it's a very dangerous prospect. I mean, yeah. I think you've already got Kirsten Cinema, who's out there to just right in the last few minutes. She put out a statement not even committing uh, right. to the, to the, the so-called White House. Friends. She said, you know, it's good progress. So I think the, the, the potential chances for a bait and switch here are, are very real. Uh, I think, and I think, look, I think we have to be honest about it. One of the big problems here is that the Progressive Caucus uh, which has a lot of leverage here still. The, 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 they need that caucus's vote to pass the infrastructure bill. Uh, that They haven't been clear about what their red lines are. They have made statements that they want the reconciliation bill to be robust, 
They've made statements uh, saying that they want it to be strong. But those are fungible words. They haven't said, listen, X, Y, and Z needs to be in the reconciliation bill or you're not getting our votes. And that has opened, that I think has facilitated and allowed for uh, this sort of haggling situation where the reconciliation is just, bill has just been cut and cut and cut over weeks and weeks and weeks. As Cinema and Mansion, every single day, they, you know, they make some declaration, I don't like the tax policy, I don't like the paid leave policy. I, they, they, Mansion and Cinema have been able to essentially put these statements out that prompt the Democrats to gut their own bill. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a betrayal from within that is, uh, I don't recall any time in my lifetime other than Joe Lieberman blowing up the public option where we've seen Democrats be so completely and thoroughly betrayed by other Democrats. Do you? No, I th- and, uh, but I think the Lieberman example is right. And I know people use this term, the rotating villain. Uh, that the rotating villains, uh, uh, for, for whatever reason, there always seems to be one two of these people who are sabotaging uh, the party's promised agenda. Now, if you're cynical, you say, look, the rotating villain is actually deliberate, like that, that these people actually represent more. Oh, I think this is this is the, the a this is the 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 the, the Koch network, the right wing billionaire network. Uh, I think this is their strategy. They don't need to own every Democrat. They only need to own one or two in the Senate. They only need to own 10 or 20 in the House. So, you know, they, they, they fully own the ones that they really need to own. And when push comes to sh- shove, those people come out. And then the second part of that whole strategy, in the Senate anyway, is maintain the filibuster so that when, for example, if there was legislation to regulate the banks, um, you know, there are senators who are owned, Democratic senators who are owned by banks who would probably vote against it if there were no filibuster, if it was a 50-vote thing. And they would get outed and they would get, you know, they would be the subject of all this public outrage that Manchin and Cinema are now experiencing. But they don't have to do that. They can vote for the legislation and pretend they're in favor of it, knowing that it's going to be killed by the filibuster, by the Republicans. So it's like this fig leaf that everybody gets to hide behind. And by the way, it's not just Democrats who do this. Republicans do it, too. Of course. And that and that is the problem. And, and I keep going back to it's not like this is a new problem. This is exactly what happened in 2009 and 2010. And the reason we did this podcast series, uh, Meltdown Now, is not to just complain about the past, but to say, look, the past is screaming at us, to, uh, at the Democrats, to not do this. This is exactly what they did to disastrous consequences that led to Donald Trump. Now, the, there's another story from history uh, that we also talk about, which is the opposite of, the, uh, of what happened in 2009 and 2010. In the 1930s, uh, you know this better than anybody, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt came into power in a similar crisis and decided, listen, we have to actually deliver real help to people immediately. And the interesting thing is, is that FDR explicitly acknowledged and understood that doing that wasn't just an economic necessity that it was a political necessity to preserve democracy. There's all sorts of passages, quotes of FDR saying, basically, the way to preserve democracy is to show people that democracy, a democratic, small-D democratic government, works for people. That if you do not do that, that you're running the risk of right-wing authoritarians saying, you see, the democratic process doesn't work. I mean, there was a a quote from him about other countries losing their democracy. I'll butcher it here a little bit. But it's basically that he said other countries have seen their democracies fall, uh, not because people don't like democracy, but because they saw inept government. And ultimately, people decided to sacrifice liberty and democracy in the name of getting something to eat. And the point is, if you keep showing people that, that they're voting, they're using democratic institutions, Institutions to vote people into power, and that the people in the power in, in power do not deliver on their promises. You're essentially telling people democracy is not worth defending. That is the danger here. That is what Donald Trump sees on, and that is what another Trump, or maybe even Trump himself, will seize on if the Democrats do not deliver what needs to be delivered right now. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you, David. You also participated in this uh, new movie, uh, Don't Look Up, uh, with Leo DiCaprio. Tell us about it. Sure. It's a, it's a movie coming out on Netflix uh, at the holiday season. Uh, it is, without giving away too much about it, it is the story of an asteroid is headed towards Earth, and a pair of scientists are doing everything they can in, uh, to try to warn the government 
and uh, use the media to get the government to respond uh, uh, properly about it. It's a hilarious movie, but it's also an important movie in this way. Some people have thought, I've heard about it, they think it's a climate movie. Other people think it's a pandemic movie. But what it really is about, Tom, is about whether our system, our media, our political system has a capacity to take in indisputable facts, process those facts, and respond, respond properly and rationally to those facts? Or have, is that system, that media and political system, so corrupt and so, uh, so uh, focused on frivolizing everything that we can't even constructively process basic facts anymore? That's the central question of the movie.